This is a pretty strange situation I find myself in. I hope you sympathize with me. I'm addressing a room full of people, a, a hall, a football field full of people, and I don't know hardly anything about what all of you do. <laughs> so, be nice to me. My uh, association with you, if I can call it that, began, uh, oh, it must have been two or three years ago, somebody called me, uh, a computer scientist called me and said um, that there were a group of people here in Silicon Valley that would pay $3,000 to have dinner with me. <laughs> I thought, what the hell is this? <laughs> so, um, and it took me some time to find out. I mean, over the last, uh, I didn't really understand what had been going on. I'm now beginning to understand a little bit more of what you are doing in your field and the way in which it comes in part from some things that I've done. Um, but when I faced the question of addressing you, and earlier, uh, about well, a few months ago, I faced a similar thing when I was asked to write an introduction to Richard Gabriel's book. And again, the question for me was, what in the world should I write about? What is, what, what is there that I could say that would be of interest? Um, and because I, in a way, started out in computers many years ago in the late 50s, um, this question became quite fascinating to me and quite absorbing. Um, and at first I was given, I mean, Jim, for example, when he invited me, he, he, he was uh, very friendly and I, I said to him, look, what, what do you want me to talk about and so forth. And he said, oh, no, it doesn't matter, just talk about anything and pe because it's you and because of the history of this pattern thing, people will find it interesting. <laughs> so that was... Uh, so I thought, well, what should I really talk about? What is the connection between what I have done and I'm doing now in the field of architecture and what you are doing and trying to do in the field of computing. And um, in, in effect, what I'll do in the, in the, uh, in the three quarters of hour I've got here is to tell you where my thoughts went as I stepped through this and as I've been thinking about it uh, during these last few months. And I ended up, actually, with something that may startle you and may, uh, you, you may uh, find quite strange. But I'm, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what that is just yet. Um, so I'm going to, in effect, I'm just going to do three things. I'm going to talk, first of all, about patterns and pattern languages, what I did about that, a few little points about problems that we encountered, why we did it, how we did it, and so forth. That's sort of a historical thing, really referring back to uh, late 60s, early 70s. Then I'm going to summarize the theoretical framework which has evolved out of that, which is uh, about to be published in a series of, of volumes uh, collectively called The Nature of Order, which is a, a book that will be put out by Oxford University Press in a few months' time. And that is a fairly radical departure from what the pattern language and those theories uh, contained, although it is consistent with them. That'll be the second thing, and I'll just try and sketch that out in the hope that there might be some carryover or that you might possibly find it interesting, even though, of course, I will have no way to directly apply this to your field when I tell you about it. And that's all roughly where I'd got to as in spring of this year, those two steps in thinking about this. And then when I, when I wrote the introduction for, for Richard Gabriel's book, I, that was really as far as I'd got. If I say what I'm doing, maybe some of you uh, folks might find it interesting or be able to extrapolate. I couldn't really find that satisfying. And I felt that there is some more significant connection between your field and mine, or perhaps that there is, 
And the third thing I'll talk about is, is, is how I now perceive that connection. Obviously, I suppose that those of you who know what I do, you know I'm an architect. And all of my life, I've spent trying to learn how to produce living structure in the world. That means towns, streets, buildings, rooms, gardens, places which are themselves living or alive. And my sad assumption here is that for the most part, what we have been doing for ourselves at least the last 50 years or so, perhaps starting somewhere around World War II, essentially has virtually no ability to produce that kind of living structure in the world. So as inhabitants, and as, as, as here we are in our daily life, but, but this living structure which is needed to sustain us and nurture us, and which did exist to some degree in uh, traditional societies and in rural communities and in, and in early urban settlements, uh, has disappeared drastically. Now, of course, um, that's a debatable matter. Some people would say, what are you talking about? It's all absolutely fine. Uh, I suppose the architect of this particular room would say that. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it isn't fine. It's a hell of a problem. It's a serious problem. It affects every man, woman, and child on Earth. And we are so ignorant about how to do this. It, it, it is, it's lamentable, and it's very, very serious. Because, of course, uh, we're building, because the population of the Earth is growing, the way economic development works, actually already most of the habit ha habitable environment is something that has been built in these last 50 years. So the fact that we don't really know what we're doing and the fact that it is not nurturing is a very, very drastic matter for all of us. So anyway, this is, that's my concern. That's what I try to deal with. And the initial ideas that materialized in the, pattern, in the published uh, pattern language was first of all, of course, just to try and get a handle on some of the physical structures that might make the environment nurturing. And secondly, uh, to, to, um, to do this in a way that would allow this to happen on a really large scale. And what I mean by that is, you know, architects build a very, very small part of the, uh, of the world. Um, most of the physical world is, is built, uh, well, it's just built by all kinds of people. It's built by developers. It's built by... Uh, do-it-yourselfers in Latin America. It's built by uh, uh, hotel chains, railroad uh, companies, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how could one possibly get a hold of the massive amount of construction that is taking place on Earth and, and somehow let it be generated in a good fashion and in a living fashion. And this is not merely because of the scale problem, but also one of the characteristics of any good environment is that every part of it is extremely highly adapted to its particularities. In traditional society, where people by and large, for example, either built or laid out their own houses, their own streets and so on, the adaptation was natural. It occurred uh, because it was in the hands of the people who were directly using it. So with the help of the kind of pattern language which, which existed in traditional society, 
they were able then to generate a complete living structure because this local adaptation that had to happen here and here and here and here could happen because they all shared these languages. Now in our time, actually the production of the environment has largely gone out of the hands of people at large in society. And uh, so, so, so one of the efforts of the pattern language was not merely to try and identify structural features which would make the environment positive or nurturing, but also to do it in a fashion which could be uh, in everybody's hands, so that the whole thing would effectively then generate itself going forward. Now my understanding of what you are doing with patterns And, and here, I mean, my comments, take them with a grain of salt, I do, because I do, I'm ignorant. I, I, I'm, I'm not in your field. But uh, the way I, when I look at the work that I've seen, I see that the format of a pattern, context, problem, solution, and so forth, it's kind of a neat format. Um, it allows you to write down let's just call them good ideas, uh, in a way that can be discussed, shared, modified, and so forth. So it's, a, it's kind of a really useful vehicle of communication. And I think that insofar as patterns have become useful tools in the uh, development design of programming languages or and of programs, um, these, these, uh, they, they, it works that way. It is kind of a neat format, and that's fine. Now the pattern language that we began did have other features, and I don't know whether those have translated over into your discipline. I mean, there was at root, behind the whole thing, a continuous moral preoccupation with under what circumstances is the environment good. And of course, in, that, in our field, that, that means something. I mean, it means something important, vital. Uh, and there are certainly plenty of people who will debate whether it's a, an objective question. I mean, some people are still going around saying it's all a matter of opinion. Uh, I think that's a dying breed, actually, the people that are going around saying that. But, but in any case, I don't know whether that sort of moral component exists in the way in which you've done things. I, I understand that the patterns, insofar as they refer to objects in programs and so on, uh, they may be, they will make a program better. That isn't quite the same thing, because then the issue, again, if I'm translating from my experience, would be, well, do they go far enough so that the, the program or the thing that is being created is morally profound? actually has the capacity to play a more significant role in human life, a deeper role in human life, will actually make human life better as a result of its injection into the system. Now, I don't pretend, by the way, that all of the patterns that we wrote down in a pattern language are like that. I mean, some of them are like that and some of them are less so. But at least it was the constant attempt. That's what we were after. I don't know whether you are after that. I haven't heard a whole lot about that. So I have no idea whether that is what you're searching for or are you only searching for a, what shall I call it, a technical performance that is good out of a program. That seems to me a very, very vital issue. Um, people have said to me, well, how did you, meaning me and my colleagues, how did you create that pattern language that's in the book or other pattern languages? What kind of a process was involved? And uh, one of the things that was constant throughout it was that as we came up with these things, we were able to judge them and tried to judge them according to the extent that they that when present in the environment, they really did make people 
more whole in themselves. Now you can say, well, how in the hell did you test for that? And that's a long story, which is not one I can deal with right here. But, in the, but the point is it was going on. And the second thing that was going on, when one had a language under development, there was an issue of to what extent does that language produce entities that are whole and coherent? In other words, suppose I write a pattern language for a campus, and I think I've got some sort of a language that looks like it will actually do the job. I can let it loose by giving it to people and say, look, generate a campus with this language. Let me see what it looks like, or you see what it looked like, or, or we test it ourselves. And many of the uh, languages that one produces do not generate coherent objects. Th that is, they, they bunch of good ideas, and one can sort of put something together, and uh, a few fragmentary structural ideas will be present in the result. But we were, so we were always looking for that. We were always looking for the extent to which, as a whole, a pattern language would produce a coherent entity. And again, of course, one has, to some extent, criteria problems. How do you tell whether it's coherent and so on and so forth? Again, a bit too long to go into, but the point is, that is what we were looking for all the time. And again, I have no idea to what extent that is true for you and whether you do that. So far as a layman look, trying to read some of the works that have been published by, by you in this field, it looks to me more as though mainly the thing is kind of a neat format that is a good way of exchanging ideas about programming. And that part is working very well. But these other two dimensions, the, the moral capacity to produce a living structure, and the generativity of the thing, that is, its, co its capability of producing coherent wholes. I haven't seen very much evidence yet of those two things, but again, that could be just because I don't know how to read the literature. So that's sort of, that's my historical view of what we were doing with pattern languages and the little bit of a glance that I have had at what you do with these concepts. How am I doing for time, generally? Am I, what am I? Good, good, good. Plenty of time. Now, I began to notice I guess in the late 70s, two things about our work with the patterns and the pattern languages. Especially under the circumstances that I was interested in, which was where others were using these patterns to generate buildings. The buildings were okay, but not profound. There was often a lot of neat stuff going on in them. People were uh, improving certain features. Perhaps the daylight was improved, or perhaps the entrance of a building might be improved, or the characteristics of, of a street might be improved, or, 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 or an alcove in a, in, a, in a bedroom might make it more intimate, or something like this. But uh, so there were various isolated features that were very definitely improvements and allowed people to feel that they had control over their own environment and succeeded in embodying that control in the real buildings that they made with this material. So that was good. But nevertheless, were they profound structures to what extent did they really have this living substance that I've spoken of? And I must say, I mean, and this, is, this is late 70s, and I had really begun to see the results and begun to see the kind of things that were happening out there in the world. 
when this stuff was applied. And I, w I, was, I was not happy with what I saw. I felt that we had fallen very far short of the mark that I had intended. But I also realized that whatever was going wrong or was not adequate wasn't going to be corrected by writing a few more patterns or making the patterns a little bit better. There seemed to be something more fundamental that was missing. So I started looking for what that thing was. The other thing that happened around that same, around that same time was that I began to notice that there were a small number of structural characteristics that appeared to exist recursively in space and that were sort of the more fundamental stuff that the patterns were made of. These were very um, simple ideas. I mean, I can name some of them very simply. Uh, levels of scale or positive space or alternating repetition. One or two are a little bit mysterious, one called the void, so forth. Anyway, there's 15 of these things, but that I began to notice that um, the particulars that were being gathered together in various particular individual patterns seemed really to come always from these 15 or so deep properties that kept occurring again and again and again. Now the other thing that was happening around this time, this is the late 70s, early 80s, is that um, we, my, my colleagues and I, began toughening up our ability to discriminate between living, more living structure and less living structure. That is, at the time of doing the pattern language, we'd really been rather intuitive about that and not very rigorous. And um, we were just trying to be, uh, just trying to do a good job in some, some intuitive sense. But, uh, but at this point, we felt it was pretty important to try to get a fix on, well, what is the difference between a chair which has a more living structure and a chair that has a less living structure? Or the same for a doorknob or the same for a main street in a town or, or, or large structures and small in other words. But the question is, if you want to say this one has life, this one has less life, can you say that with any degree of accuracy? Can it in fact be made of relatively objective matter which people will agree about if they perform the same experiments? And we did find such techniques, such experimental techniques. And the use of them greatly sharpened our ability to distinguish, well, okay, so what was really going on and which structures then correlated with the presence of life in an object or in a bit of the environment And so these 15 properties that I've mentioned that were sort of the substrate of the patterns we had discovered began showing up more and more clearly as the main correlates of this living structure in places, buildings, things, outdoor space, and so forth. Now, I need to say a word about the kinds of criteria. When I say, well, yes, we did find objective criteria. Because you've got to understand, in my discipline, where the, the tremendous vested interest you know, among architects that there is no such thing as truth, because everybody wants to do their own damn stupid thing, you know, and get away with it. So, 
depending on who you talk to, they'd say, well, this uh, stuff Alexander's been telling is a lot of horseshit. There is no such thing as objectivity about this and so forth. But anyway, I'm here today and they're not here, so I'm telling you that there is such a thing. <laughs> Now, the nature of these experiments is very peculiar in a way. Because what the experiments ask, let, let's suppose that we were trying to, um, we, let me t we got a sidewalk somewhere, a bit of a street, and we got another sidewalk, another bit of a street, and we're trying to come to conclusions about which one is a more living structure. And my belief, by the way, and I, I probably should start with this, I mean, when I began trying to find these experimental methods, my belief always was that there really is such a thing and that actually everybody kind of knows it, but that it has been suppressed. That is, because of the uh, worldview that we have and the way of looking at things and the nervousness about uh, intellectual rigor, uh, that in a way, people, though they have these judgments within them, somehow are separated from their ability to make these judgments correctly. In other words, what I'm trying to say is, and this is just with the sort of instinct that I had going in, was that this is something childish, really, that everybody knows, but for some reason we're so messed up that we can't see it. And. Uh, so these experiments were in effect designed to penetrate that and cut through it. The essence of these experiments is that you take the two things that you're trying to compare and ask, for instance, is my wholeness increasing in the presence of this object or in the presence of this one, and is it more or less? And you might say, well, strange question. I mean, what if the answer is don't know or don't have any effect and so forth? Perfectly reasonable that that could happen. What turns out to happen is that if you say, well, yes, yes, it's a difficult question. It's, uh, it kind of sounds a little bit nutty, but anyway, please humor me and answer the question. Then it turns out, first of all, that there is quite striking agreement. It's not 100%, not but very strong. Stronger, a strong agreement as one gets in a lot of scientific uh, experiments of other kinds. And that um, the really strange part is that the things which are then measured by experiments of that sort are not, you see, it's sort of, all of these different experiments have to do with something like that. Do you feel more whole? Do you feel more alive in the presence of this thing? Do you feel that this one is more a picture of your own true self than this thing? You know, whatever. In always looking at two entities of some kind and comparing them as to which one has more life. It appears to be a rank bit of subjectivity. In other words, it sounds like, well, okay, fine, I mean, maybe this is a truth about human beings in the sense about our cognition or about our perception or about our feelings, but that's not necessarily the same as saying living structure as such is a real thing that resides in those objects. But anyway, to cut a long story short, it turns out that these, these kind of measurements do correlate with real structural features in the thing and with the presence of life in the thing measured by other methods so that it isn't just some sort of subjective I groove to this and I don't groove to that and so on but it is a way of measuring a real deep condition in the particular things that are being compared or looked at. And what's odd about this and in a way, as our work went further and further, it kept bringing 
big practical matters always back to the human person. So in other words, let's take, you take a parking lot. There's lots of technical problems in a parking lot. I mean, it's got to work. You, cars have got to be able to move around. Uh, you know, there's security problems. There's uh, in and out problems. There's uh, not very complicated ones. But I mean, anyway, the, it's, a, it's essentially a technical thing. And the question is, OK, is it working well or not well? And yet, the functionality of the thing measured by various ordinary bits of technical discussion correlates with this condition of do I feel myself to be more whole when I am in this parking lot, let's say, as a, compared with that one? Or even in engineering uh, design, for instance, where one has the structural behavior of a bit of a bridge or the uh, patterns of movement in something where, where, where a lot of people are walking about and there's kind of complicated questions about, about how they move and so forth. I mean, very, very practical matters um, are nevertheless correlated with these very personal questions about whether the thing has life, whether it promotes life in me and you. So there began to be developing, in, in my views on of this, um, a, a view of structure which at the same time that it was objective and it was about structures that are out there in the actual thing, is somehow coming home more and more and more all the time into the person. Because the life that is actually in the thing is correlated in some peculiar fashion with the condition in ourselves when we are in the presence of that thing. And just to go a little bit further than that, what it meant was that the objects that are most profound, or again, ob I, when I say object, I mean, you know, again, building, street, doorknob, shelf, room, dome, bridge, whatever. The objects that are the most profound, functionally, are the ones which also promote the greatest feeling in us. Now that's a very peculiar thing because of course if you just hear that cold at first sight it sounds like rank sentimentality and you just say well it can't be true. Why should it be true? And yet it's a discovery which um, accords very well with the times because we are living in a period where that is perhaps the most noticeable and most problematic feature of our world, is that feeling has been removed from it. When I make a joking reference to this room, and without going on beating a dead horse, but I mean, really the problem is that there is, that the, whatever feeling there is in here is obviously not a profound feeling. Um, and the, the failure of that profound feeling to exist in the world around us at small scales, large scales, middle scales, here, there, and everywhere is tragic. It's, it's the thing that we miss. And of course, people have been writing about this, well, for many decades. I mean, writers have been, uh, have, 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 have of course, made this known. We all know it. Um, the difficulty is that people don't seem to know what to do about it. And if anything, at the moment, I'm talking now again about my own discipline, I mean that of architecture, but the, 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 it, the problem is really getting worse. It's not getting better. Uh, the world that is being built is more unfeeling. We are, in a sense, more lost, more fragmented, um, more sort of wandering about in this lonely desert than before. So that if there is a way of looking at structures which both deals with real functional structure in the ordinary technical and practical sense and simultaneously has its roots or its origin in this question of human feeling, 
that will be a very huge and positive step. It is a very peculiar intellectual development. And I mean, I need to stress that, that the apparatus within which these kind of things that I'm talking about here are true or are made visible and, and, and look reasonable is quite, is quite complex and, and somewhat unfamiliar. So it is actually a slightly different worldview from the one that, we're in, 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 that we are uh, currently uh, engaged in. In particular, just going back to these 15 properties that I mentioned and the ability to be precise about the nature of living structure, at the root of these 15 properties, there appears to be a recursive structure with only one type of entity. The, this entity, uh, in my own current writings about it, I call them centers. Uh, one might, I suppose, probably call them a lot of things, and I've, I think there may even be at a stretch a little bit of a connection with some of the things that you call objects. Um, these centers are in effect field-like structures that appear in some region. They don't have a sharp boundary, but they are the sort of focal organizing uh, entities that one perceives. And, in, and within the within the view that I'm putting forward here and that I've gradually come to in, these, in this last decade and a half, everything is made of these kind of centers. The centers are more living or less living, and that's essentially the only important property that they have. And the question of whether a center is more living or less living depends recursively on the amount of livingness in the other centers that it is made of, because each center is actually a structure of other centers. And since many of you are quite comfortable with mathematical uh, thoughts, that sort of recursion is uh, fairly familiar in this field that you have. Um, but it is, anyway, at the core of this, um, of this thing that I'm speaking about. Now, and w whether this would translate in any interesting way to things that you do, I don't know. I can't say, and there's no way I could speculate about it. Um, what is true, I can tell you from my own experiences and that of my colleagues in these last years, is that when one has that view of things, it becomes enormously easier to produce living structure. So that it, ha it has immediate practical carryover. If you start understanding everything in terms of these living centers, and you recognize the recursion that makes a center living or less living, or more living, dependent on the, the other centers that it is made of and the other larger centers in which it is embedded, suddenly you begin to get a view of things which almost in and of itself starts leading you towards the production of the more living structure. It's a much more powerful and beautiful view than was embodied in the pattern languages because when one has constructed this view and then you say, well, now what is a pattern really? You look back at that sort of thing and then it turns out that patterns are merely a, a few of the structural invariants that appear within these centers under very, very particular conditions. So they're certainly interesting and important, but they don't have the same depth or the same universal character as these uh, other things that I'm speaking about now. And, and, and it's because they're only really fragmentary perceptions of this deeper structure that I'm describing that they are ultimately unsatisfactory, I think, and not capable of uh, delivering the goods. Now, I'm still now talking about my sort of part two of my talk here part two of my speech, which is this work that I loosely label The Nature of Order and the books that I've been writing about that. 
If one has identified living structure with a reasonable level of objectivity, and if one has identified this recursive center-based structure as being the key to the whole thing, all that's all very well. But then, of course, the practical question arises, how the hell do you produce this living structure? What do you have to do to actually produce it? You can recognize it, you can talk about it, you can clumsily try to find your way towards it in a particular case, but in general, what are the rules of its production? Now, the answer to this, I'm going to summarize extremely briefly, but, it's, but it is fascinating and it's of great importance and it will lead me on in a way to my part three. It turns out that these living structures can only be produced by an unfolding wholeness. That is, there is a condition in which you have space in a certain state you operate on it through things that I have come to call structure-preserving transformations, maintaining the whole at each step, but gradually introducing differentiations one after the other. And if these transformations are truly structure-preserving and structure-enhancing, then you can come out at the end with living structure. Very abstract, I know, but the punchline is the following. Number one, that is what happens mainly in the living structures we think of as nature. When you analyze carefully just what's going on and how, how things are happening in the natural world, it, th this sort of structure-preserving transformation tends to be what's going on most of the time, which is why when nature being left alone, one recognizes, by and large, living structure is being produced. In the approaches that we currently have to the creation of the environment, that is to planning of buildings, planning of towns, construction of buildings, and so forth, uh, that is simply not what is happening. The process of design that we currently recognize as normal is one where, uh, whether it's an architect or somebody else, is sort of m moving stuff around, trying to get into some kind of good configuration. Boom, you know, here's the good configuration. And then here's a set of drawings of this good configuration, and now we're going to build this good configuration, and so on. But in fact, since it isn't unfolding step by step in the structure-preserving way that I'm talking about, the result is never a living structure. And it's not too difficult, in effect, to, well, I'm perhaps exaggerating a little bit, but I'll just call it anyway, you write theorems which say, under the kind of conditions which are current in the construction industry today, you cannot produce living structure. So the poor son of a bitch that did this thing <laughs> was stuck with it. There was nothing he could do, or she. because it was part of the process by which this kind of entity is produced in today's society, that it cannot come out with a living structure at the end. Now that is a shattering discovery. And so a very large part of my work and that of my colleagues in the last, uh, in these immediate last years, has been one of trying to define social processes, economic processes, administrative and management processes, which are of such a nature that they permit true unfolding to occur in society. And then actually trying to make these things happen. I mean, this is what, we do, what, what, what I do most of the time, is I'm trying to do real projects of one sort or another where I am introducing this unfolding process and trying to make it work under the conditions available to us in 1996. The shifts involved are gigantic. 
That is the shifts in thought, in practice, in administration of money, in contracts, all sorts of real nitty-gritty things that in a way one would much rather not mess with, you have to mess with because it is those processes which are undermining the ability for this whole thing to be structure-preserving, unfolding. So this involves very, very big changes, changes that are not only very big but very difficult to implement. But, in my view, absolutely necessary. So that's roughly the end of my second section. Now, some of the people who were kind enough to invite me have in effect assured me that if I just sort of sp spill this kind of stuff out that there'll be those among you that somehow might latch onto it or know how to translate it into something that's more directly relevant to your own concerns. And I, I suspect that's uh, likely, given where you've been with pattern languages. And in a way, when I came to the end of writing uh, Richard Gabriel's foreword and struggling with that, this is about as far as I'd got. That is, okay, so here are some of the more recent things that we've been doing. This is what they're like. This is the nature of them. They may be relevant to you folks, conceivably. I can't tell. It's up to you to tell. So forth. Anyway, that's all that's sort of pretty thin, but that's about where I was somewhere in the spring of this year. How much time have I got now? 10, 15. Okay. I started thinking about, about a couple of things that then led me to feel that there was a possible coincidence in what you are doing and what I'm doing, where they might merge. You'll probably think I'm off my head by the time I get done with this next section, but that's all right. <laughs> First of all, let me just explain where, where I am in my own life in regard to these problems. I've been telling you things that um, I think are important, important discoveries in some ways. As an architect, um, of course, like any body concerned with those things. I have a passion to try and make these things happen. It's not enough just to say, well, living structure isn't being produced. Um, I have to ask myself the question. I do ask myself the question all the time. Okay, well, what are we going to do about it? Here, here, here we've got this poor earth sinking under the weight of all this dross, and what are we actually going to do? Now, you know, I do a $10 million project here, and I do a $10 million project there, and, uh, you know, life is short. I mean, a, a few of those projects, and what is it? I mean, it is a pr it's, it's an atom in, in the proverbial bucket. It's nothing. All of the efforts of the architectural brethren, even if I could persuade them, of the truth of these things, which is happening, but rather slowly. It's a drop in the bucket. The total amount of built stuff on Earth 
is something on the order of about 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 13th square feet of construction. Manhattan is somewhere on the order of 10 to the 9th. And if you include all the exterior space, the part that's somehow having to do with human beings and that is part of our immediate world, whether we're talking about gardens and streets and agriculture and all of that, then we're somewhere up around 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 square feet. When I started out 25 years ago or 30 years ago, I really thought that I was going to influence that stuff fast. I, especially when I got to the pattern language, I thought, boy, I've really done it. I mean, this is going to work. No problem. I've done nothing. Nothing. I mean, this is all nice talk, you know, and there's a few people who have learned a few things and have been influenced. But I mean, meanwhile, we've got this gigantic amount of construction out there, which is the world that all of us live in, that is still going on in exactly the same fashion. I believe that the cultural process of influence is simply too slow to be able to take care of this problem. In other words, the process by which one sort of discusses these kind of things, shares ideas about them, gradually influences the way people are thinking so that hopefully gradually larger and larger percentages of, of bits of the environment might turn into living structure. That is a very slow process and I don't think it is fast enough to do the job. And yet I view myself as responsible for that. I mean, I don't mean alone. I mean, but as a professional, that's my job, is to try to understand how we can get hold of that and do something about it. So I'm sitting there thinking to myself, right, I'm going to talk to people who are, in a way, the core of the computer revolution. You probably realize, I'm not actually sure you do, given a couple of breakfast conversations, but um, I, I would think you would realize the extent to which the world is gradually now being shaped more and more and more indirectly by the efforts of all of you that are sitting in this room. Computers programs, I should really say, I mean, it's not the computers, it's the programs, control the shape of manufacturing, the shape of the transportation industries, construction management, diagnosis in medicine, printing and publishing. You almost can't name a facet of the world which is not already to some very strong degree under the influence of the programs that are being written to manage and control those entities or those operations. I know this is in its infancy. It's going to look a whole lot different given, I mean, how long has this really been going on? Not more than about 10 or 15 years. Of course, the, pre the preparation for it goes back a lot further than that. But really, this is quite new. And yet, as a body, I don't think that you, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably totally speaking out of turn here, I just don't know. But it seems to me, at least, you know, I've thumbed through the uh, proceedings of this conference, for instance, which Jim was kind enough to give me yesterday. I don't really see discussion about what are we supposed to be doing with all these programs. How are they supposed to help the earth? And yet, the capacity to do that is sitting right here in this room. I mean, that is an amazing situation.
When I had the pleasure of beginning to meet some of the various folks who introduced themselves to me over the last uh, year and a half from this community, I began to be fascinated by the number of them that were sort of closet architects. I mean, you know, this person is really uh, interested in ecology and is an editor of an ecological magazine. Bill Joy is writing about workstations in the concrete physical sense that is familiar to me as an architect. Uh, Jim Copeland is dealing with social structures, that is the actual social structures in organizations. I, I, I don't know a long enough list, but my hunch, my f sort of sense of it is that an amazing number of you who got into this pattern game in the pursuit of your normal professional endeavors are also very profoundly interested in the real physical world, that is in the world in which we inhabit. Now it is conceivable that you collectively could change the very drastic situation that I described a minute ago. Let me just go back to the unfolding for a moment. I talked about these structure-preserving unfolding processes. Compared with the pattern language of mine that you've seen in the book that you, some, some of you have, in more recent times, my colleagues and I have written things that are much more like what you call code. They're generative processes which are more like sets of instructions that produce the things. They are actually sets of instructions which allow the unfolding to occur in space in just the way that I was talking about a minute ago and therefore are capable of producing living structure. The published pattern language by comparison is rather static. You know, it consists of these objects which are interesting and which you somehow try to mush together. But it's possible to have processes or procedures which will actually generate living structure. Because of the complexity of the situation and because of the way software is going, software that was designed to do that could very rapidly take the world by storm. You've probably heard the sort of, you know, it's a sort of familiar thing in the, in, in the history of the development of, of, uh, in technical change. Very often, the people responsible for a certain specialty are then followed by a technical innovation, and then the people that are responsible after the technical innovation is a completely different group of people. For instance, I mean, this is the old saw, you know, the, the people who built the buggies for the horse and buggy did not then turn into Henry Ford. Henry Ford and the people that were building automobiles came from left field and then took over, and the horse and buggy died off. It is conceivable to imagine a future in which this problem of generating the living structure in the world is something that you would explicitly recognize as part of your responsibility. Now this is a kind of level of marriage between you and me that is of an entirely different sort from the one that I was invited to contemplate. I was effectively brought here to say, okay, what new things have you been doing, Chris, that might spin off and be useful to us, you know, in our neck of the woods? And I've, my parts one and two were about that. But my part three is about something quite different. I want you to help me. I want you to realize that the, that problem of generating living structure is not being handled by architects or planners or developers or construction people now. 
There is no way that they're ever going to actually be able to do that because the methods they use are not capable of it. The methods that you have at your fingertips and deal with every day in the normal course of events are perfectly designed to do this. So that if you have the interest, you have the capacity and you have the means. I heard a rumor at breakfast that some of the people in this room begin to worry about their jobs. I have no idea if that's true. But I was told there's a sort of undercurrent of unease of where is all this going? There's this huge expanding phenomenon, programming and so forth, and yet an uneasiness about, well, where is it all headed? What is it going to do? Please forgive me, I'm going to be very directly blunt for a horrible second. But it could be viewed that the technical way in which you look at programming at the moment is almost like guns for hire. In other words, you're the technicians, you know how to make the programs work, tell us what to do, Daddy, and we'll do it. And what I'm proposing here is something a little bit different from that, which is a view of programming as the natural genetic infrastructure of a living world, which you are capable of creating, managing, making available, and which could then have the result that a living structure in our towns, houses, workplaces, cities, is an attainable thing which it has not been for the last 50 to 100 years. That is an incredible vision of the future. I realize that you probably think I'm nuts because this is not what I'm supposed to be talking about to you. And you may say, well, gosh, great idea, but we're not interested. But I do think you are capable of that. And I don't think anybody else is going to do this job. I've enjoyed uh, talking to you very much. Thank you. Wow. <laughs>